rises, you are able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
peace from above and for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. The first reading is from Acts, the ninth chapter. Dorcas was a faithful and devoted woman of charity in the community of Joppa. Her kindness and her work with clothing were well known, especially to the widows in town. When she fell ill and died, Peter raised her back to life through the power of prayer. Now in Joppa there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for 
for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll now read Psalm 23 responsibly, verse by verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures, and leads me beside still waters. You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The second reading is from Revelation, the seventh chapter. Christ is the shepherd who leads his faithful to springs of the water of life. Christ is also the lamb who vanquishes sin and suffering. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, and thanksgiving and honor and power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. rather 
low point in the history of a long-suffering people. Babylon knew that Israel would not go down easily. And the only way to conquer those headstrong tribes of Israel and keep them down was to break their backs. So the Babylonians abducted their leaders, the military personnel, the craftsmen, stripped them all down of all of their property and forced them to march 500 miles to the northeast. Estimates of the number of exiles ranged between five and 10,000, depending on which book of the Bible you are reading. The Babylonian maneuver was not all that different from what the United States government did to the Native Americans in the Trail of Tears, when we sent thousands of Indians from Georgia to Oklahoma. Forced migrations are incredibly cruel but also very effective in breaking a people's spirit. After 40 years of exile and two generations of struggle, the Hebrews were offered the option to return to the desert that their grandparents called home, to return to Jerusalem. Some decided just to stay in Babylon. Many were born there, that's all they knew, so they stayed. But a remnant of the group went back to rebuild the walls of the temple. And somehow, in that rebuilding process, they found faith and hope. They declared that whatever they had to face, they would be secure because God was with them. With almost nothing to call their own, and the most uncertain future that you can imagine, they proclaimed, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There in a barren wasteland, they said, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. In 2000, the Boston Globe printed pictures and writings of children who had participated in a writing contest, and the subject was courage. The paper ran a whole page of essays written by sixth graders. Candace Bruce wrote about how hard it was for her to accept her parents' divorce and her mother's attempts to keep her from her father. Sherwin Long helped to save his younger brother who couldn't swim. Zi Zhu Chen spent the first years of her life hiding in China because she was a twin, and the government had threatened to jail mothers who had more than one live birth. Brandon Kincaman wrote about being autistic, being bullied at school, the taunts of other children, but yet he would keep going because he needed to go to school in order to be a scientist, and that was his goal. In these faces and in the stories, you can see children who have survived some pretty hard struggles. Though they never say anything explicitly religious in this article, the writing illustrates enormous faith. Thou anoints my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There was a woman named Gloria, the mother of six, five boys and one girl, grandmother of 14 and counting. While raising her family, she served as a church organist, choir director, piano teacher, her small stature was deceiving because she was much stronger than her frame would suggest. When she learned that the leukemia had come back, she was faced with rather hard choices, different courses of treatment. And Gloria chose the hardest one because it held the greatest hope of full recovery. 
She told her family that if she was going down, then she was going down fighting. She died, which surprised everyone because they all thought she was definitely going to beat this. The pastor said that he could see the treatment was not easy for her. She even told him that she felt bad which was an uncharacteristic admission on her part. During the visit, she spoke about dinners that she had prepared for her children. She told how she juggled caring for small children and about getting six children ready for church on Sunday morning. She told how proud she was of their college years and how fond she was of their spouses. There, in the valley of the shadow of death, she feared no evil. These portraits are not stories of other people who are braver or better than you. These people may have different names, but they're folks just like you and me who find God when they need to. And then there's the picture of Jim. I met Jim more than 20 years ago when I first began attending Our Savior Lutheran Church in Virginia. He was such an authentic person. He was compassionate toward others and had a real enthusiasm for the gospel. One Sunday morning, he told us his story. He grew up in a very poor coal mining family and he had to quit school in order to uh, help his parents raise money to feed the family. As an adult, Jim could not read. And it really pained him to not be able to read the Psalms or the Gospel himself. So he started taking classes, and he learned. And he stumbled over the words, but he did it. By the time I met Jim, he was a frequent lesson reader in church services, even when he had to struggle over the words. He led prayers directly from his heart, and he wanted all people to hear how Christ had died for them. Jim got esophageal cancer. From the time he heard the news until his funeral was only about six months. In those months, this once large, boisterous man was reduced to a skeleton with skin. We had no pastor at that time, so the council members took turns going to visit him. During one of the visits, he said, the Lord had been good to him. And I must have made a face of some sort because he said, I know that sounds strange that I would say the Lord has been good to me. Maybe it's hard for you to see it, but God has been good. That's one thing I am sure about. I feel it. There he was, in the midst of the desert, and he is describing green pastures to me. My point is that we cannot avoid conflict or trouble or pain. Sometimes life is actually fuller when you head right into the trouble that none of us can avoid anyway. Whether you were born a twin girl in China or a handicapped child in Boston, the psalmist says that God is with you. God sees your struggle. God knows that you have adversities. If you are someone with pain, the psalm says that God is there with you. But the promises of God are not those of a magician. God doesn't wave a wand to eliminate adversity. I mean, that's what most of us pray for, right? If it's all the same to you, God, I'll skip on the pain and the suffering part, right? But what God offers us is much more subtle. God prepares a table before you in the presence of all that would confound you and grieve you or pain you. God meets you in the very place where you feel cut off at the knees and God blesses you with something new and unexpected. 
in the midst of your awful trials and tribulations, God prepares a banquet of blessing. In the desert of your tears, God will lead you to cooling waters. In the most frustrating trouble you know, God will meet you and hold you and lift you up. At one of the lowest points in Israel's history, the people recalled the poetry of King David. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My friend Jim never tried to explain to me why he felt so close to God as he fought so valiantly to stay alive. Perhaps it's because it's just so difficult to explain faith. All any of us can do is declare the faith we know the faith that we have experienced, and trust that God will lead others to those same green pastures as well. Amen.
using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all of creation. <clears throat> Gentle shepherd, enable your church to respond to the voice of Jesus. Give us unfailing trust, unafraid to join in Jesus' work of renewing all things. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Feed your people at the table of creation. Prepare a safe place for those whose environments are dangerous or unhealthy, especially those making difficult journeys. Prosper your creation for the sake of every living thing. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Warm the hearts of all who celebrate and all who mourn on Mother's Day. Accompany those yearning to be mothers. Help us to heal from broken family relationships and open us to receive your nurturing love from all who serve mothering roles in our lives. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Seek out those who weep while they await healing or consolation. Dorothy. Set people in their path who can provide the care they need and wipe away every tear from their eyes. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Inspire the words of prophets and saints who employ, employ innovative imagery to stretch our understanding, as did Julian of Norwich, whom we commemorate today. Send Christ to instruct us with motherly care. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up, Lord, all of those who are fleeing from Ukraine, who are struggling to find places of safety, to find shelter and food, places where they may raise their children until they can return home. We pray for an end to the conflict there. We pray for a change of heart in the leadership of Russia. We pray for all of those who are fighting. We thank you for those who have opened their homes and their lands, their borders, to allow these people to come in. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Enfold us in the great multitude of saints from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Wash us in your saving grace every day, guiding us to your waters of life. We pray, Lord, for the family and friends of Anne Duza. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your mercy, O oh God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
Zoom with us. You gave your only Son, 
that all who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. Amen. Follow the Lord Jesus. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive our as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Please rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace.
water to give new life, and the bread of heaven to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to Jesus' resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through the same Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. May God, who has brought us from death to life, fill you with great joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever.